record. Good. All right, chapter two. We're going to study the chemistry and the physics involved in these two topics. Radiations from the sun. We first want to take a look. What do we get from the sun? What type of radiations we have? And we're going to learn some general physics about light, okay, about the word light. And then we're going to study the chemistry involved an ozone layer. Why do we need to protect the ozone layer? And what is the ozone layer? What does it do? And why do we study these two topics together in this chapter? Okay, as usual, you always get a few questions to think about uh, while we're studying this chapter. First is, what, what is sunlight? Okay, what is it? What, what property does it have? And how many different types of radiations dip in the sunlight? And how, how, are they, are, how are they different? Okay, how do different types of radiation differ in energy? And what is the link between sun exposure to and skin cancer? And how does Earth's atmosphere protect us from the sun, from the radiation? And can this source of natural protection be eliminated? Or if so, can it be restored? And finally, how do sunscreens and sunblocks work? Okay, so that's why we're talking about these two chapters together. All right, so first, okay, first is Take a look at the radiation, okay, the sun. Okay, uh, dissection we call dissecting the sun, the, the the radiation, the electromagnetic spectrum. The radiation from the sun is called electromagnetic radiation. They are basically waves composed of both electric and magnetic fields. That's what we call electromagnetic radiation. And most importantly, okay, not only their waves, most importantly, the radiation from the sun can be two parts, can be divided into two parts. One part is visible, means what? We can see them. Our naked eyes are adapted to see them. Most of the part, invisible. Okay, we're gonna see both. We're going to actually see the whole spectrum of radiation. Now, the visible ones, you guys have seen a lot in your lifetime. After raining, if there's some sunlight, you will see what? Rainbow. Okay, rainbow. Rainbow is a spectrum of seven colors, ranging from red to violet. Okay, violet. So what is a rainbow? Okay, why we call that visible radiation from the sun? The rainbow is actually a piece or a region of sunlight, a region of radiation being separated by a device called a prism. Okay, the prism can, of course, is a is a is a is a is a, is a uh, optical device. But in after raining. The water vapor layer of clouds or layering in the, in, in the atmosphere serves as a device that separates visible light, the portion of the sunlight, visible light, into seven colors. That's why we see rainbows. Now, we know this part is called visible, has seven colors, but why? This device can separate these seven colors. How are these seven colors different? In order to answer the question, we need to take a look. The nature of light. Okay, we said light, light is what? Radiation waves. So what is the wave? Wave is something looking like this, right? Imagine you, 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 you threw a stone to a, to a quiet lake. What do you see? Water waves, is that right? Very similar. Light waves looks just like this, okay, just like this. Now, there are two very important terms quantifying these waves, making one different than another. One term is called wavelength. The symbol here is lambda, okay, Greek letter lambda. What is wavelength? Wavelength is the difference between what? Two peaks, or you can say two, two bottoms or whatever. They're the same. 
Apparently, these two waves, this guy, the wavelength is what? Longer, this guy, the wavelength is what? It's shorter. That's one thing, quantify these different, why one wave is different from another. Another term is called frequency with Greek letter mu. Okay, frequency. What is frequency? Frequency is in one second, how many waves are passing at any single point? Remember, waves are what? Moving, just like you're, you throw a rock into a river. The waves are what? Moving, right? Moving forward in one direction. So how many waves are moving up, like a, over a fixed point in one second? That's called frequency. Now, let me ask you guys, how many waves are passing a single point? These two waves, one has a longer wavelength, one has a shorter wavelength. Which one do you think will pass more within the same amount of time? Let's say this is the point. Which one thing passes more within one single second? Shorter one. A shorter one, right? Shorter because they're smaller, right? Each wave is this much. What is a wave? A wavelength is a wave. This is much as one wave. So because it's shorter, what? Passes more. So when the wavelength is shorter, the frequency is actually what? Higher. Very important. Okay, mathematically, this is how they're related. Lambda is, again, what? What is lambda? Wavelength. Mu is? Frequency. frequency. Then multiply together. Equal to C. What is C? C is the speed of light. Because it has a big number. 3 times 10 to the 8th meter per second. Means what? Light will travel 300 million meters per second. In vacuum. But normally, even though we're not in vacuum, we're in the atmosphere. Light, we assume the speed of light is the same. So that means in our universe, this, the, the fastest thing is what? Speed. speed of light. And this is a constant. That means no matter what, no matter where, and no matter what light you're talking about, the speed is what? The same. Constant. So this thing doesn't change. Take a look. If this thing doesn't change, if something multiplied together equals to one thing, doesn't change. If one thing increases, the other thing will what? Decrease, right? Because the whole thing multiplied must be the same. So that is why these two are what? Inversely proportional. What is inversely proportional? Longer wavelengths, what? Shorter frequency, we call it lower frequency. Shorter wavelengths, what? Higher frequency. And of course, these are some rearranged mathematics. You divide by lambda on both sides, you get what? You get mu, right? You divide mu on both sides, you get what? You get lambda. So that means what? That means for mu or lambda, you know one thing, you can get what? The other. You can calculate the other. Why? Because speed of light is the same. Always 3 times 10 to the 8th meter per second. 8 meter per second. Okay, now we know wavelengths and frequency. Let's take a look. The radiation components. Okay, radiation components. In light, we said they can be classified into what? Visible and what? Invisible. We know visible is what? Rainbow, seven colors, what, what we can see. And the invisible ones are these. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light. I mean the one, sorry, this is the visible one. And uh, ultraviolet, x-ray, and what? Gamma ray. So these are the invisible ones. Then this, this is the visible ones. The other one, the invisible ones. So, how are these lights different? Okay, they're all radiation. They're all components of the radiation. So how does one different differ from another? They're different in what? In their wavelengths or what? Frequency. The speed of these are all the same. Three times ten to the eight. They're all what? Light. But they're different lights because these things have different what wavelengths or frequency that is 
why light, the electromagnetic radiation, is a spectrum. What is a spectrum? Is what? It's a range of things, right? You can see that on this end, gamma ray. Here, X-ray. Ultraviolet, rainbow, the visible one, the one we can see. IR, infrared, microwave, radio waves, and what? Even longer radio waves. So this spectrum listed the most important types of radiations. But they are different in what? In their wave, wavelengths or what? Frequency. Now, in this spectrum, on this end, the X-ray, gamma ray and ray end, are the ones with high frequency and what? Shortest wavelengths. This end, the radials, okay, the radials, are the ones with what? Short wave, I'm sorry, low frequency and what? Long wavelength. Do you see that? The bottom is wavelength. See that? The wavelength is increasing. It's this way. But the uh, frequency is what? Decreasing. Okay, decreasing. And our eyes are only sensible to what? This tiny region. Between 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers wavelength. We can only see the seven colors. Anything else here, the light, we cannot see. They're around us. We just cannot see them. Now, this seven colors, now you know their seven colors still different in their what? Wavelengths or what? Frequency. Take a look at the seven colors. Which one has the longest frequency? I'm sorry, longest wavelengths. Red means what? Red has the lowest what? Frequency. Very good. And which one has the shortest wavelengths? Violet. And violet has the highest what? Frequency. Very good. And again, of course, in, in my classes, I always tell students you have to memorize the whole spectrum, even the seven colors. But you guys, I said, if you're working on something, you can use your book as a reference. But again, you need to know the order of these radiations. And now you know they're different in what? Wavelengths and what? Frequency. Does it make sense? Okay, seven colors, they are what? Again, sometimes I, I forgot. Red, orange, yellow, green, indigo, a uh, blue, I'm sorry. Red, orange, yellow, green, uh, blue, indigo, and violet. Okay, blue, indigo, and violet. Okay, they're, they're not really, you can even see that. They're, they're kind of like what? Gradually change, right? We call this spectrum continuous spectrum. So that means there's really no separation between red and orange. You just change slowly. When you decrease the wavelengths, you change from red to what? To orange, like that. You can see there's no really lines separating them. That's kind of continuous spectrum. Okay, continuous spectrum. Again, know the secrets, and we, we already know what their differences are. Okay? Next. Okay, next. How about the energy? Okay, how about the energy? In order to talk about the energy of these Radiations, we first need to bring out some theories about light. Okay, that theory is called wave particle durality of radiation or wave particle durality of light. So basically light has two natures, have two features. One, they're waves, just like we said. Another nature, they're particles. Okay, particles. Of course, this is a very complicated theory by Einstein. When light more behaves like a wave, then the particle nature will be very tiny. If light behaves more like a particle, then you don't see much of the wave property of it. That's called a duality. Okay, they don't coexist. Okay, but here is the theory. I just want to give you some background. Okay, first is radio radiations. Light may be described as having both wave-like and particle-like property, particle -like properties. That means they're particles, tiny particles. Light consists of small particles. These particles were no matter, not matter, but pure energy. Okay, that's one thing is different than what we studied about particles. Normally particles we call the what? Like atoms, uh, particular matter, or, or molecules. These particles are what? Are matters, right? They have mass, they have volume. Light particles, they don't. They're just pure energy like a bullet, 
but they don't have ma mass, they don't have what? Void. That's different. So light particles are not matters. Okay, not, we think that's what we call this physics, right? We said this in our chapter, we talk about some physics because they're not even chemistry. Chemistry is the study of matter. Okay, Einstein called each of these particles a quantum of radiation. Okay, quantum radiation. Now, light must be made of these packets of energy or quantum energy. We call them photons. Okay, what are photons? Photons are these what? Are these particles. Okay, light particles. And they carry the momentum and energy from our source of light. Okay, from the source of light. So this is why light has energy. Because what? Because these photons, they have particle property. They're bullets, they get hit on something. That's why they have energy. And the energy of the light, which is important here, is related to, what is this? Is this symbol? The salt frequency. E stands for energy. H is a constant, because the Planck is constant. So you can see that E is directly related to what? Frequency. Meaning, higher frequency, what? Higher. higher energy. So let me ask you guys, without turning the next page, which one of those radiations in our spectrum has the highest energy? Gamma rays. Why? Because gamma rays has what? The highest frequency. Which one of the visible light has the highest energy? Violet. Violet. Does it make sense? So you can see that this is spectrum again. Um, light on this side have what? Higher. Higher energy. The highest one, of course, is gamma rays. Okay, gamma rays. And then x-ray. X-ray is the same. You go to hospital, you get x-ray. That's x-ray. Okay, nothing like a mysterious. UV, seven colors, IR, microwave, and lovers. And now from this spectrum, you know that microwave energy is high or low. Microwave energy high or low? Low. It's low, right? Lower than what? Then the light. Then light we see, light, then, then the light of the light bulb. What is the light from light bulb? Visible light. Because we see them, right? So you guys, I know you guys have may have heard of something. Microwave is what you need a shield or something. Is you close to a microwave is dangerous? Is that dangerous? No, because energy is very low. It's even lower than what red. Okay. Okay. So again, uh, use these as a practice. I think you guys are great. Understand everything well. Okay. Just play with it. A few concepts. One is what the relation between what. Wavelengths and what? Energy. Frequency. Right? Wavelengths and frequency. They are what? Inverse. High frequency, short what? Wavelengths. And then the energy is related to what? To frequency. That means inverse reverted related to what? Wavelengths as well. Right? Long wavelengths means what? Low energy. Because what? Frequency is low. Right? Again, these are very simple practices. And uh, you will see questions like this, asking what? Hey, I give you these things, infrared, microwave, ultraviolet, visible. Can you arrange them in the order of increasing wavelengths? Then you need what? Arrange them. You will see questions in your test and quizzes. Among these for which one is the longest wavelengths? Microwave, right? Followed by what? Infrared followed by what? It's visible and then the shortest one is what? UV. Okay, and the same, they ask you, hey, can you arrange these colors by the energy? Increasing, if you see the word increasing means what? You need to arrange them from small ones, that means lowest energy to what? To the highest energy. Okay? Okay, these are the practice. Okay, practice. Okay? Next, after we study different radiations, let's take a look at the radiation from the sun. This chart, or the, the pi, pi chart, shows you the radiations from the sun and the percentages of, of these radiations. As you can see here, the radiations are mainly these three types, right? They are what? Visible light. 
IR and what? UV. Okay, UV. Of course, regarding the percentage, 53% is what? Is IR. And we're going to study that in chapter 3. This is the part of an energy that keep us warm. Without the IR, we, 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 we basically, this planet will be like, like the moon. Colder is inhabitable. And our eyes, again, are involved to see the visible light. With percentage, visible light is only 39%, even lower than land. But the intensity of it is what? It's the highest. I mean, it's most intense. That's why our eyes are involved to see the most intensive portion of the light, which is what? The visible. This is the wavelengths. And the visible is from 400 to 700. This is the ultraviolet. This is what? IR. IR is long from 800 to all the way to 4,000 nanometer. Okay, that's the wavelengths. Get okay. okay, the range. However, okay, however, we do get 8% of this guy. UV. What is UV? Ultraviolet. Let me ask you. All these three types, which one has higher energy than visible? Out of these two types, which one has higher energy? Ultraviolet, right? Because ultraviolet has what? Higher frequency. Shorter wavelengths. You see that? Wavelengths is what? Shorter. So that means, okay, that means these guys have higher energy than visible than the light were adapted to. So their energy may be what? May be a threat to us. Okay, may be a threat to us. Okay, they are actually, now maybe they are a threat to us because of what? They're shorter wavelengths, but what? Higher energy. Okay, higher energy. Now if we look close to the UV portion, okay, this is visible from 400 to 700. Okay, very important numbers. Okay, 400 to 700. It's visible. If you look at the region of UV, which is very short, from 200 to 400 nanometers, that's the wavelengths, we can further divide it into three types. Okay, you may wonder why we do that. Later on, you can see, by the way, why we do that. Okay, three types, are, again, are different than what? In their what? Wavelengths. The shortest wavelengths one from 200 to 280, okay, close to 300, this part, we call that UVC. A short here from 280 to 320. Here, this part. We call what? UVA. This part from 320 to all the way to 400, we call, I'm sorry, UAP. We call that what? UVA. So ABC. But no, which one has the highest energy? UVC. C has the highest energy. C because C has the what? The shortest what? Well, how we divide them and approximately what the range. You don't have to memorize exact the numbers, but kind of know where it is. 200 to 280 is what? C. 280 to 320 is B. 320 higher is what? Is A. Okay, now you might wonder why, why we do that. Why we split them into three parts? The reason is here. Show me this table. You can see the comments. UVC. Okay, UVC. 200 to 280, even though in this guy has the highest energy, but it does not cause a problem. The reason is UVC, that part of the radiation is completely absorbed by something in our atmosphere. Oxygen and ozone. Okay, ozone. UVC, most damaging because highest energy, but we don't worry about it. UVB, and let's go UVA. This guy has least damaging, even the orange energy is lowest, but still UV, higher energy than visible, but lowest energy UV. Even though it is the least damaging one, it 
reaches to the surface of the earth in what? In the greatest amount. That means what? This part of UE is the one we what? We're exposed the most. We should deal with the most. And UVB is somewhere between. Most UVB, especially the shorter UVB, is still absorbed by ozone. Some UVB reaches to the surface. Okay, this picture maybe give you a better idea. Now wording, you can see that UVC what? Completely absorbed. See that? UVB, the shorter ones, damaging ones, still absorbed by ozone, but somewhat longer ones what? Gets to the surface, make it to the surface. UVA almost all gets to the surface. Okay, to the surface. Okay, we'll explain what is this ozone. Okay, what is it? Where it is? What is it? And how? Of course. Okay, but we'll just put it here. Why we study UV? Because that's what we get from the radiation. That's the damaging part. And which part of UV? We're talking about what? UV and UVB are the one that gets to us, our skin. Okay. And this picture shows how does UV damage or poses a threat to us. Because UV has higher energy. Then the photon could do two things. One thing is to kick out electrons from a neutral molecule. Converting a neutral molecule into a positively charged species. Remember, electrons are kicked out something that becomes what? Positively charged. That's one. Even shorter UV means stronger UV can even what? Just break a bond. Okay. Break a bond of a molecule. This, if in turn this UV hits our bio molecules, such as what? Such as our molecules in our cells, this is what happens. Okay, this is what happens. You can see that UVA penetrated more, UVB may be absorbed by the surface, but when they are, okay, when they are hitting our biomolecules, okay, biomolecules, they will break their bonds, such as DNA and proteins. And if the energy is low for UVA, for example, they're not strong enough to, to cleave the bond. They may hit molecule like water, create charged reactive species. And those reactive species will also interact with our biomolecules, causing their damage. So this results, okay, results, skin cancer. It results skin cancer. So here is some articles okay, from Mayo Clinic. You can click and take a look. More info about skin cancer and what is melanoma okay, and uh, how melanoma is linked with the intensity of radiation and also the latitude at which you live. Okay, how does it interact? So these are some reading okay this link okay, you can also in your own note is the reading assignment and the discussion assignment for chapter two okay do next week not I mean next next week okay again you always follow them this is not due next week right next Friday one day but you can do it anytime you you feel hey I'm, I'm reading now I can do it tonight it's fine you can do it out of time that's okay but this is the discussion assignment for chapter two showing you different types of UV and also showing you how does UV interact with biomolecules and what damage it does okay, and cause. Okay, this is the picture showing that a healthy uh, brain sea urchin in embryo. And this is the UV radiated. You can see that was something weird popped out, right? So uh, this is a link contains pages of particles. Okay, make sure you click next page, next page. Just no, don't just only read only the link. It has chapters. Okay, read all the chapters. And uh, our society, okay, our society has a color-coded UV index scale used to predict the risk of sunburn or from the overexposure to the sun. And you can see this is different colors. Low means low, green, yellow color means 
low exposure or, or less harmful. Uh, more violet means what? More purple, more UV, right? And uh, that means more harmful. And this index is by number, ranging from 0 to, to 11 plus. Okay. Uh, you may see those in your weather apps. Okay, weather apps. Okay, and uh, this practice shows you uh, some very quick overview of these three types of UVs. Again, among those three types, which one has the longest wavelengths? Longest wavelengths? A, which is close to what? Close to violet, right? Which one has the shortest wavelengths? C. C. Okay. And which one has the highest energy? C. C. Okay. Highest energy. And uh, the number C question, you get very, very simple. They, they ask you, if a, a, if a sunscreen claims that it can, it is used to protect against UVC, do you think that sunscreen is legit or, or, or they're just over out of the appetite? Do you think we need a sunscreen to protect us from against UVC? So we don't because UVC what? It doesn't get to our surface. Even get doesn't get to us. So there is no reason. Or, or believe somebody would develop a sunscreen for help from that is UVs. Most sunscreens are on UVAs, okay, UVM, UVAs. Okay, and uh, since, since we're on the topic, we, we briefly talk about the sunscreens. Okay, uh, what are sunscreen? Sunscreen are basically two types. Physical sunscreen or, or chemical sunscreen. Most of the sunscreen you guys use if you go to the beach are physical sunscreens. Okay, means what? You just put on block, sunlight blocking sunscreen, uh, UV or what, into, onto your skin. Okay, physical sunscreens basically use nanoparticles made from these two uh, metal oxides, titanium oxide or zinc oxide, oxide. Okay, both oxides, okay, both oxides are, 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 are white color solids. That's why you always see sunscreen means what? White paste, right? And nowadays, they, they, they use better technology to, to make the particles a little smaller. So you, when you use the spraying ones, they may be transparent, but they're the same thing. Either titanium oxide or zinc oxide, you can read the label. Okay, both, either one of these two, or sometimes both. Okay, another type is chemical sunscreens. Okay, I've, I've never used or seen uh, around us, but these basically are organic molecules that absorb UV light. Okay, absorb UV light. Because they're organic molecules, there are some health or environmental concerns. Okay, tomorrow. So if, if I were choosing, I would definitely go with physical sunscreen. Okay, unless your skin is definitely allergic to these physical sunscreens. But these UV blockers, they are basically structures containing multiple bonds that can absorb UV light. Okay, and make them change to something else. Okay, that's why there are some health and environmental concerns. They may be absorbed by your skin as well. Okay, those physical sunscreens won't be absorbed by your skin. Okay, so that's uh, UV okay, and uh, radiations, of course, and then we talk about the UV. We talk about different parts of UV and why UV is something we need to care about in this chapter. And very briefly, we talk about sunscreens. Do you have any questions, guys? Anything you're interested? Anything you want to further ask? Okay, let's move on. Next, okay, next. Let's take a look. How UV is absorbed, right? We talk about UVC, what? Totally absorbed by what? Oxygen and ozone. UVB, mostly absorbed by ozone. So how does it happen? What is ozone? What is the layer of ozone? And how does it absorb in the second part? Paper part, we'll talk about this part briefly, then we'll cut up in a certain one. Okay, first, where's the ozone? This picture shows you again, we may see that before in chapter one, is the regions of the atmosphere. Okay, I don't know these terms actually, they're sometimes from different subject. But here is uh, the sea level, and here is uh, Denver, and this is how high the Mount Everest is, and here's where the jet plane Flies, but this region we call that troposphere, basically the lowest atmosphere we live. Okay, we live, and by there the, the air density is extremely low already. That's why your planes what is pressurized, right? 
but above 15 kilometer or 9.3 miles, okay, even higher than, than jet plane flies, between 15 and 30, okay, between 50 and 30, I mean, between 15 and 50, we call that stratosphere, but between 15 and 30, this region of the stratosphere, that means way above us, even way above the airplane flies, there is a region that the ozone concentration, even though this region, the air con con density is extremely thin, thin, you cannot breathe there, but of course we die right away. You know? okay. Once you get out of the plane, you, you basically cannot breathe at all. But even though the density of air is very, very low, but in this region, in the stratosphere, the ozone concentration is higher than anywhere else. Does it make sense? And that's why we call this region the what? The ozone layer. Okay, it's a layer of ozone which has higher concentration than anywhere else, but doesn't mean it's high. It's just higher than what? Than anywhere else. Okay, here is a picture showing that. Okay, picture showing that. Uh, you can see normally ozone concentration is zero, close to zero. Here, because of pollution, we do get some uh, what? ozone. We talk about in chapter one. Ozone is what? It's a bad gas, right? So in some cities, you do get some ozone concentration, but it's still low. Okay, it's still very low. But if you take a look, between 15 and 30 kilometers, or 9.3 to 18.6 miles, the concentration of ozone is what? Significantly higher. And this is again called ozone. Okay, called ozone. And again, to clarify, no fluffy, thick, you think, blankets of ozone like a cloud existing here, nothing. Here, the, the air is very thick, but the concentration of ozone here is the highest in the area. Okay, here is the concentration to show you. The concentration of layer is, what, 12,000, what, PBB, what's PBB? Parts per what? Per billion. Think about this one divided by a billion. It's still a tiny, small number, very thin, but this layer, even though thing contains enough ozone molecules to what? To protect us. Okay, to protect us. To make this planet livable during the day, you can go out. Instead of what? You have to wear a, a, a big hat or umbrella all the time. Okay, all the time. Or put on sunscreen every every morning. Okay. That's all. Now, okay, let's take a look. After we know where the ozone is, look, let's take a look at the molecule ozone. Okay, what is ozone? Ozone we have seen before is what? Is O3. We know if it is O3, it means it only contains what? Oxygen atoms. Only oxygen. How, how many? Three. And if it only contains oxygen atoms, we call ozone is what? An element. Is that right? Element is what? A pure substance only contains what? One element or one type of atom. What? Oxygen. And we know oxygen usually exists as what? O2, which is what? Oxygen gas. So what are these two guys? They're both oxygen elements, right? But they're different molecules. We call those two ozone, uh, these two molecules, or these, these two substances, allotropes. Okay, allotropes. Allotropes are what? Different forms of what? The same element. Oxygen, ozone are both oxygen elements, but they're different substances. Okay, besides that, oxygen has allotropes. Some other elements have allotropes too. For example, carbon. Okay, the most two famous allotropes you guys probably know is what? Graphite and what? Diamond, right? Diamond is carbon. That means what? Diamond only contains carbon atoms bonded together. Graphite, the one you draw with a pencil, with pencil is what? Is also carbon. For element the same point of view, these two are the same thing. The carbon. Okay, of course, price different. Okay, besides that, we have other types of carbons. I'll show you the next picture. And phosphorus also has many uh, allotropes. Why they're by different colors. Okay, this picture shows you different types of uh, carbon allotropes. Okay, the first one is carbon uh, is diamond. You can see that how how 
uh, carbon atom are arranged in, in diamond. That's why diamond is beautiful in an organized crystal form because their microscopic view is very nicely organized. This is graphite. Okay, graphite is what? Layers of carbon atoms are organized together. Because of a layer, you, you, you can what? You can draw, right? You can draw with a pencil. Why? Because the layers of the carbons get scraped off. You can put it on that piece of paper. Okay, and there are other types of carbons. Okay, um, this is kind of like a fullerene. It's like a football. Okay, it's like a football, like a ball. This is carbon nanotube. You probably have seen that. You can see this in a tube shape. But every single one is a carbon. Okay, it's carbon. So that means they're all what? They're all elements. Is that right? No matter how big, how small they are, they're because they only contain what? Carbon atoms. They're all elements. Okay, they're all elements. This picture shows you uh, different types of phosphorus allotropes. Just for your view, okay, that, that's white phosphorus, extremely flammable, okay, combustible. Okay, it just it can, can, can burst in flame by itself, even playing on the table. Okay? Next, let's take a look. Okay, take a look. How do we get ozone? And how does ozone? protect us from UV radiations. But in order to study that, there is many chemistry to be studied. Okay, many chemistry, partly like the small facts to be studied before we can study that. Ozone formation and how does ozone protect us. First is, where does ozone come from? Okay, ozone come from oxygen. Okay, you can see this reaction is what? Balanced, right? Three oxygen end up with what? Two ozone. But this process, okay, this process, converting oxygen to ozone needs a lot of energy. Okay, needs a lot of energy. And it's not like single step. It actually involves two to three steps. Okay, this one just show you overall what happens. How do we get ozone? Energy and what? Oxygen. And if a, if a reaction like this or process like this takes energy to complete, takes in energy to complete, we call the reaction endothermic reaction. Okay, we're going to see this word again in later chapters, but this is a, one of the few endothermic processes we study in this book. Endothermic means what? This process needs what? Energy. And later on, we're going to see what energy does it use to convert oxygen to ozone. Okay, what energy is over there above the sky to convert oxygen to ozone? Let's study that. But in order to study this process, again, I said, we need to study chemistry. Okay, chemistry. The first chemistry, and very important one, is the anatomy of atoms. What is an atom? We know atom is what? The smallest building block for what? For elements, for what? For compounds, for molecules, for anything, for matter. That's the smallest beauty part. And we know that atoms do not change or do not what? Disappear or destroy or be created during chemistry. That they're the smallest beauty block. But does it mean atoms cannot be further what? Dissected. Atoms do has do have smaller particles than atoms, meaning these three. Okay, meaning these three. Atoms are made of three types of subatomic particles. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Okay, electrons. This picture shows you, and not the best anatomy of atoms, but a very nice one. Okay, not the best, I'll describe you minutes. But nice one means they show you where these particles are located. Here, at the central portion of the atom, is called the nucleus, which is made by protons and neutrons tightly bound together. Does this make sense? Okay, this is what? Proton and neutrons, they're tight bound together. They're tight partners. And the force is called a strong force. It's very important in physics. Electrons are located outside the nucleus in a very, 
very wide region outside the Middle East. And they're moving very fast. Okay, they're moving very fast. Good. Three types of particles and where they're located? Good. Now, one thing I want you to take a look at them. The size. Okay, the size. Take a look. How big is the nucleus? 10 to what? Negative 15. Is that right? How big is an atom approximately? Like how big the, the electrons are really have space to, to play with? 10 to what? Negative 10. Negative 10. So, I don't know if you guys are good at math or not. Compared to the size of this 10 to negative 10, this one and this one, this, this, these two numbers, what is the difference? How many? How many times different? 10 to negative 10 and 10 to negative 14. You guys know anything about scientific notation? Between 10 to negative 10, 10 to negative 14, what is the like a great difference? There's like an extra five zeros. Five zeros, right? Five zeros is how many? 10,000. Is that right? Is that 10,000? Four zeros is 10,000. So this is what? 100,000, right? 100,000 difference. What does 100,000 difference mean? Means if the size of the atom is 100,000, the size of the nucleus is what? Is one. Do you have any idea how small nucleus is? If the size of the atom is 100,000, no matter how cubic feet, then the size of the nucleus is what? One cubic feet. Still have not much idea, right? Let me show you the next picture. If the stadium, football stadium, a football state stadium, is the size or volume of an atom, this will be the size of the nucleus. Is that small? Is that small? Very small. Okay, compare this and, and, a, and a glass bead. If the size is this big of an atom, then the size of the nucleus will be like a small glass bead. That's how the nucleus, how small it is compared to the size. Now, we know the size of the atom is, is tiny, but the nucleus is what? Extremely small compared to the size of the atom. However, even though the size of the nucleus is small, the okay, size of the small, the nucleus has almost all the mass of an atom. Okay, all the mass of an atom. This chart shows you some very important properties of these particles. First property is the charge. Between these three particles, proton carries a plus one charge. Neutron, zero charge. An electron carries a what? Negative charge. You guys see that? One thing is positive, one thing is negative, means what? Means the atom can be what? Can be neutral. Is that right? This is the charge of a proton and charge of a neutron. The mass. The proton carries a mass of one unit, because AMU is among one unit. Not one, but we call it one AMU is one unit. Then the neutron will carry the same unit of mass, one. But the mass of the electron, take a look, is what? Is zero. It means what? It means all the mass of the nucleus, uh, all the mass of the atom is where? Proton and neutron. Is that right? Where is proton and neutron located? That's why I said, even though the size of the nucleus is tiny, but it has all the what? All the mass of it. Okay, all the masses. This table is chart is very important. Okay, we're gonna use it a lot throughout the semester. Okay, again, charge proton one is plus one. Charge of one electron is what? Negative one. Charge of neutron is zero. Mass of proton and neutron are very close, one unit, but charge of electron is what? Zero. 
And to clarify that, okay, to clarify, the charge of electron is not exactly zero. The electrons are what? It matters. So they carry mass. But com compare with the mass of proton and neutron, the, the mass of the electron is so tiny, we assume they're what? Negligible. So it means what? Still, the, ch the mass of the atom is where? Proton and neutrons. Okay, but don't get me wrong. The mass of the electron does exist, but it's too small to consider. Okay, too small to consider. So, because of that, we have some very important equations. Okay, very important equations. The first important equation is because proton carry positive charge, electron carry negative charge. In order for an atom to be neutral, the number of proton must equal to the number of what? Electron. Because one is one charge, another one is negative one charge. So the number of these two must be what? Equal. Does it make sense? Okay, for example, hydrogen atom has one proton, one electron. Helium atom has two protons and what? Two electrons. You guys see that? The number of protons must equal to the number of what? Electrons for a neutral atom. Does it make sense? Next. Where do we get the number of protons? Okay, where do, can we find the number of protons? The number of protons is actually listed in your periodic table. Do you guys have a periodic table in front of you? No? No, I didn't. Yeah, you can put it out too. I mean, I'll, I'll pull one from chapter one. Yep, that one we should in chapter one. Okay. Take a look at the PR table here. We have seen the we learned that one in chapter one, right? This is called what? A period, this is what? A group, right? But take a look at these elements. Okay, in this period, okay, again, there are di different periods, maybe printed differently, but they have the same idea. Each element has a whole number right above it in this period table. You guys see that? Ranging from 1 to 2 to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Do you guys see that? That number is the number of protons. And we call the number, well, of course, we don't call the number of protons here. In the periodic table, we call these numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 15, 17, 13, 34, 33. We call these numbers atomic number. Okay, we call these numbers atomic number. What is atomic number? Atomic number is the number arranged in the periodic table. And the atomic number tells us what? Number of protons. Does it make sense? So whenever you pull up your table, you look at an element, what is the atomic number? You find it, and you know that number is what? Number of And when you know the number of you know the number what? Electrons. Is that good? Next. Because we said the mass of the atom is where? In the nucleus. What is nucleus? Proton and what? Neutrons. So the number of protons with the number of neutrons together is the mass of what? The atom. Does that make sense? So the atom, for example, here for helium atom, the mass number should be what? Four, because there are two what? Proton and two what? Neutrons. The mass number for hydrogen is what? Is one, because there's only one proton, no neutrons for most hydrogen atoms. Does that make sense? Okay. How do we, after this, oh, we can stop, All right, okay? How do we show these numbers? We use a notation like this. We put a symbol, Where, what is symbol? A single letter or what? Two letters, one capital what? What? Lowercase. Lowercase. So that's the symbol. 
We put the symbol of the element, showing here this is the what element, what atom we're talking about. Then on this corner, the bottom left corner, still we call subscript, we put a number telling people they what? Atomic number. What is the atomic number, guys, again? Number protons. Very good. Where do we find number protons? Periodic table. Is that right? This is atomic number. This is the proton number. On this corner of the symbol, the superscript, okay, on the left side, is what? The mass number. What is mass number again? Proton and what? Neutrons. And neutrons. Very good. For example, this, like this, what we look like. C, 6, 12, means what? Proton number is 6. Mass number is what? 12. Based on the mass number 12, we know how many neutrons? We know 6 neutrons. Neutrons we don't know. We have to what? We have to subtract. We always know proton. And you will be told the mass. And then what? You figure out the neutrons. Does it make sense? Okay, again, this is one of the notations. Another one. Okay, another one. Okay, I don't use this anymore. Another notation we use frequently. This is one of them. Another notation we use frequently is something like this. Use the symbol followed by a dash, followed by a number. This number will always be the mass number. Very good. C12 means what? The carbon with mass number of what? 12. It also means the car carbon, the carbon with what? With proton neutron together is what? 12. Now you may ask, hey, wh why, why you don't show the atomic number? Because we know atomic number can be found where? If you have C carbon here, then you know the atomic number is what? It's 6. No way you can change that. If it's carbon, atomic number has to be 6. If atomic number is 6, it's what? It's carbon. Because 6 protons. Does it make sense? Proton and an atomic number determine what the element is already. So sometimes we use that too. Both will be seen. Okay, one is showing both in a superscript, subscript. Another one is like this, C followed by something. That something is what? It's mass number. Okay, again, in this case, you don't need people to tell you the proton number. You can what? You can look it up. Or if you memorize already, C, carbon, is number six. Number six is definitely carbon. Why? Because there's six protons. That would never change. Okay, that would never Proton changes, element change. Does that make sense? Again, these are some basics. Next time we're going to practice some. Then uh, we'll move on and study how oxygen becomes ozone and how ozone protects us from it. So, you guys have any questions? Okay, again, uh, your company. Stop recording, mind you, then.